Hi, hello everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the session entitled as Intersection of Design and AI. And uh, as you know, uh, the role of design in business, especially in digital products and services, has been growing actually. And the emergence, emergence of generative AI has brought about the big shift and changes in this industry. Not only chat GPT, many services emerge every week actually every day uh, in creative sector and new ways of collaboration or thinking and creative outputs are coming up uh, in response to this situation. So today uh, we've got the fantastic fantastic lineup of panel panelists here uh, from design industry. Um, uh, I hope John uh, uh, will be coming, <laughs> but- uh, He just joined anyway. now. All right. Ah, Mr. Dr. Maeda has joined this session. Oh, right, wow. Yeah. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> no worries. Wow. <laughs> good, good, good to have you. Thank you. And uh, they will introduce the uh, latest thinking or case studies to discuss the future potential of design and AI. All right, so wonderful. OK, so let's start the conversation with John. Hi, John. Thank you for joining the session from the US. Hello. Hello. Okay. And uh, all right. So you uh, wrote a fantastic book, How to Speak Machine, several years ago. And uh, you gave us a kind of comprehensive guidance uh, of how we can utilize computer technology, uh, especially um, by uh, non coders and non developers. And uh, in this year, early this year, in South by Southwest, uh, in the uh, keynote session as uh, the design in tech report, you actually changed the theme from the history of design into AI conversation, right? And then you uh, discussed about how we rec recognize AI and AI utilization in design sector. So, and now uh, you entered into Microsoft um, since this year, last year, um, and uh, uh, your, uh, your role is VP, Vice President of AI and Design at Microsoft. And you created a um, very interesting project as like Semantic Connell. So first of all, uh, please uh, give us a quick introduction what you are doing at Microsoft, at what you are thinking, thinking and creating uh, with your uh, colleague at Microsoft. Please, John. Oh, well, first, I'm very honored to be here with Noah Levin. You know, in the Design and Tech Reports, I uh, featured Figma back when it was a tiny plant. <laughs> and, and so it kept growing and growing. And um, I, I was just I had a chance to talk to Noah earlier in the week. Um, and um, I'm just so excited for the future of what Figma will be um, because of his leadership. And uh, for myself at Microsoft, I have been there for... I know, like um, 11 months or so, not one year yet. I joined in um, October. And, but when, and I, when I said I was going to do AI, people laughed at me. Like, ah, ha, 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 ha. AI is not going to happen. That was October. And then December, whoa, <laughs> it's going to happen. Uh, but I was um, invited to get to work on the early version of GPT-4. And uh, in October, I was really surprised what it could do. And so Semantic Kernel is the result of that. It's an open source project to enable anyone to cook with AI at the code level. Uh, I think it's important because many traditional programmers, uh, this new way of programming is, is very different. So Semantic Kernel is, is there to help the average app developer become an AI app developer. Thank you. Uh, through the uh, 11 month uh, experience at Microsoft, uh, work co-working with uh, uh, AI engineers or developers. Um, have you changed your mind or uh, have you got any new thinking or thought or recognition about AI through this year? Um, well, I think it's going to take time is what I realized because this is a very different paradigm and it's evolving very rapidly, but it's hard to understand if you are used to a traditional uh, way of developing in more syntactic, precise ways. I think of it like uh, I just bought on Amazon, I bought uh, a giant um, bag of dice. 
Uh, because, because I feel like dice is like rice now. It's like, you know, for in Japan, Japanese love rice. So it's like all this dice and all the dice together form this kind of a magical model. Uh, so I'm using every method I can. So I now have a, a YouTube pilot on Microsoft Developer Channel called Mr. Maida's Cozy AI Kitchen to help more people cook with AI and uh, not be afraid. Yeah, in the uh, the book, How to Speak Machine, you mentioned about the computer resources and uh, powers uh, occupied by developers. But right now, as you see, uh, as you create, uh, uh, for example, Semantic Kernel is going to be empower the non-coders or non-developers to utilize power of AI, especially in the everyday um, product as like Microsoft Office or something. So what's, what's, what's mm -hmm. happening here? Uh, no, no, not exactly. So um, semantic kernel is a way to combine uh, native code uh, and semantic code, uh, which I think is like, if you think of the, the old um, legend of uh, Miyamoto Musashi, the kind of uh, two swords approach. So one sword is like uh, native code, uh, C sharp, uh, could be Python, could be Fortran, <laughs> <laughs> it could be anything. Um, and the other one is this new kind of semantic code, which involves completion models, chat models, embedding models, image making models, et cetera. The two together are really powerful. Uh, one alone is um, you know, by itself not as powerful. Thank you. So finally, uh, would you give me a word about how AI can contribute to design? or in, in vice versa, how design can contribute to design? Oh, well, that's what I'm looking forward to hearing what Noah Levin has to say, because uh, I think he's in the world of building design tools. I'm very close to the developer world. Uh, and so I, I think that I don't think about that as much anymore. Um, so I'm really interested in what he's gonna say. I'll tell you, I was playing with all the latest stable diffusion um, uh, different open source components. And I was like, wow, you've got to know a lot of stuff. Um, so I think that the tool companies will be able to deploy these ideas much faster. And I'm really curious what they will be doing. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, hi, Noah. Thank you for joining uh, in this session from um, also the States. And uh, John, uh, as mentioned, uh, as John mentioned, um, Figma is uh, the most powerful tool uh, to utilize AI in the design processes right now. So, um, uh, uh, for audience, do you know Figma? Uh, please raise your hand. Okay, oh, all right, good, good, good. 80% of our audience know about F Figma, and uh, that's good news. So, um, Noah, uh, can you quickly int introduce uh, Figma and uh, uh, what uh, uh, what is your role in Figma uh, developed software development? Sure, yeah. Thanks for having me, and, and thanks for so many kind words across the board. And so, for those of you who haven't heard of it, Figma is uh, basically an easy way for anyone to come collaboratively design things together. And so, usually, they're coming to create software, and we try to support from end to end. Whether you're starting to brainstorm, we have a tool called Fig Jam. Also curious, how many people are using Fig Jam? I would love to see. I can almost see the picture of people. If you raise your hand, if you're using that product, it's a newer one from us. I can't see, but maybe a few people, maybe not. Uh, but basically, we offer a few tools now to try to support the end-to-end -end design process. Uh, and my job at the company, I started at the company about six years ago. Uh, as John mentioned, we were just a seed of a company. Hopefully, we're a little bit more like maybe a mid-sized plant. There's still room to grow uh, as the plants behind me are hopefully hanging in there. Um, and, uh, and so in that time, basically, my responsibility is to oversee the design organization. We're about 60 people now uh, in the design organization working to make Figma easy to use for everyone. And of course, AI is, is an extremely relevant topic, probably to all of us in the room. Uh, and, and we think that they're so, we're in such early days when it comes to how this will actually apply to people's design work. So happy to chat about whatever you're curious about and you know, certainly give any insights into the way that we work together. Thank you. Uh, first of all, actually Figma uh, has been developed as a uh, online collaboration design tool. 
And uh, you know, before Figma, we have Photoshop or Illustrator, and then that is uh, kind of install-based software. And then collaboration concept was not uh, developed within that uh, old type uh, tool. But the Figma uh, actually changed all the collaboration model uh, within design processes or software development process. And on the top of that, AI is coming up, and then you acquire several uh, powerful uh, startup companies to introduce AI uh, tool set within, uh, on the top of Figma existing to, to, tool set. And so uh, would you um, introduce some uh, case studies or uh, tangible um, functionalities within uh, Figma? How are you going to, or how did you introduce AI power uh, onto the, the software uh, tool set of Figma? Yeah, sure. So I like how you sort of set the stage for one of the things that Figma came along and did that that wasn't done as much before is collaborating together in real time the way that you might if you've used Google Docs or things like that. And when I think about AI, there's something interesting where a lot of our experiences with AI are probably still single player, right? You're, you're at your browser, maybe you're typing in with ChatGPT. Uh, and so we think a lot about what does it mean to have a multiplayer AI experience? What does it mean when we're all using it together to, to work more collaboratively? And so I can give you kind of some examples of this. And there are some things we've launched and some things we haven't yet launched that we're very excited about. But even in the earliest of brainstorming phases, uh, we think of, of AI as really supporting everyone to get to a good first draft and then to refine it from there, right? It's not going to, you know, at least not yet, completely imagine a full application working end to end with just a prompt, uh, but it can get you a starting point together. And so when you think about a group of people, uh, you have all kinds of friction. Maybe there's a blank page and you don't know where to start. And so we launched something recently called Jambot for FigJam, which is uh, a widget that basically brings the best of ChatGPT into a collaborative space. And so people can come together and kind of visualize a brainstorm. Uh, let's say they're designing, you know, a shoe app to buy to buy shoes. They can come in and, and immediately start imagining anything from, you know, what it is that they're trying to create. Is it a mobile app, a desktop experience? And they're just using sticky notes, but using the best of, of uh, modern AI technology to kind of generate some starting points and get the conversation going. But we also imagine it being helpful to just, again, when you have a blank page, how do you even set up a space? It's like if you walk into a physical room when you're working together, someone had probably arranged it in a particular way for a particular purpose. And it wouldn't it be neat if AI could actually help you figure out what the shape of that room should feel like. And so in this case, it might be how to set up uh, you know, templates and sections and widgets and all the right ways. You don't even have to think about the tool very much. You're just like, I have a meeting with six people tomorrow. I don't know how to run it exactly, but I know that these people care about these things. And, and that's enough context to really get things going and to get a starting point. So you'll see a lot more from us coming later this month in FigJam. And then there's lots more happening in Figma as well to try to help, again, people get to that first draft. Uh, and like, like John had mentioned, thing, technologies like Stable Diffusion aren't as accessible if you're not in tech. And so we absolutely want to make sure that people have easy experiences, getting quick generative images if they need them. But, uh, but more importantly, setting up the scaffolding of their applications. So making it easier to set up uh, what could be complex for some people, like a full prototype, but just getting started with just a quick couple you know, of words and a prompt. And so there's a lot of things we're exploring. We're in the very early days. I feel like you were very, definitely in the seed stage of what AI can mean for design. Um, and, and I'm excited to see where it goes. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, uh, Emi-san. And uh, Emi-san is a multi, kind of literally multidisciplinary artist or creators. And then utilizing uh, NFT, high-tech uh, agenda into your work. So, and, and you, you run your own company too, right? And uh, so please uh, quickly introduce your uh, work and your activities first. And then uh, if you give us a, a case study, how, how to utilize AI in your work. Hi, my name is Amy Xano. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. Um, uh, I'm also a lecturer of Tokyo University of Art um, Design section. And uh, AI has been empowered me a lot. Um, I actually um, started using uh, Ari, Jan, uh, Ari Gan uh, from 2017 for using for my music video. I'm also a musician, but I haven't really uh, found out um, um, how do I output with AI? Uh, but I started use, using Midjourney uh, from this year, um, uh, Ari, um, Ari January, uh, just like you, you guys. 
I guess. Uh, but I made it in a museum e exhibition, which is happening right now in Kanazawa 21st Century Contemporary Museum. This is my first museum exhibition in my life, AI. Just get me there. And also, um, I, I was privileged to um, showcase my uh, AI-generated digital fashion um, in Christie's uh, Gucci collaboration auction uh, this July. And yeah, just seven months, six months, uh, AI just bring me to that stage. And also, I co-founded um, uh, NFT Anime Studio uh, last year, uh, Shinsei Galvers, uh, nostalgic and futuristic uh, sh shoujo anime vibes, sci-fi anime that I've been creating. And with the community, uh, we have like uh, 5,000 people um, who's holding Galvers, Gal. Uh, we, we constantly engaging uh, with uh, AI creation, uh, for example, like a background of anime or enemy design or mechanical design, everyone in a Discord using Midjourney, and also uh, we are making a Galvers stable diffusion model, and everyone can access to the create new character or like each one of uh, fans have uh, their like their story of the character. Uh, one of 8,888. So yeah, w without AI, I'm not gonna be here <laughs> today. So I I'm very fortunate in for this era. Thank you. Before AI, you created very fascinating project with your son. Yes. To create a kind of probably first generation of um, NFT art, right? And mm -hmm. then yeah, that was has been very famous on the that community. Yeah. And uh, after NFT, AI, uh, generative AI is coming up, right? And if you uh, compare the uh, uh, design processes or a creation process with AI and with uh, AI, uh, have you find any kind of fundamental uh, change or differentiation in between them? Okay, thank you. And for, for adding the uh, information just Kenya dropped, uh, my son is also an NFT artist. I have a AD, uh, I have a ten years old. You son. should search it. That's yeah. really <laughs> and interesting. His name story. is a zombie yeah. zookeeper, and his art has got viral like two years ago. Uh, with Steve Aoki bought like three of them with six ETH, and it, it was became like most famous NFT case in Japan. Um, just FYI. Um, yeah, uh, so AI uh, has really empowered me because uh, I've been I've been really bad at programming. Um, so like without code, I can program graphic and all the uh, generative art and also uh, video makes me really easier. And also, um, I think from the neurodiversity point of view, I'm very hyperactive ADAD, ADD and I cannot master um, new new um, new technique uh, it takes really long journey for me um, but uh, with with AI I can just uh, talk to AI and um, make a presentation make an email to the curator and also media people and it's helps me really yeah and also um, I was really uh, like struggling uh, making like even though my music video it cost really uh, so I didn't have a I I, I really I, I wasn't really making money by my art for ten years even though I've been doing creative stuff I have to juggle with multiple jobs but right now I'm full time artist and with which like blockchain and uh, AI. Uh, and pardon me. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. And then I fully understand about how AI uh, empower you to create something new. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have Nora from Figma today, so i really uh, interesting in how AI could uh, empower or change the process of collaboration, because uh, your work is always kind of collaboration, mm -hmm. and you have team, and you invite uh, very different types of people from all, all over the world, uh, set up the team and create something new. And a team with AI or team without AI, that's uh, what kind of uh, things uh, are, uh, you know, do, do you know, notice any kind of um, benefits or um, 
a good point to utilize AI to uh, boost up the, the collaboration in your team. Are you asking me or no? Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so uh, I, I think with AI, it's easier uh, easier to um, share the uh, visual. Um, everyone has a different inspiration, different ideas. Uh, for example, uh, when I have a brainstorming with Shinsei Galbraith's fan community, everyone is different uh, from different backgrounds, and some people um, um, teach me like uh, um, um, Chinese uh, history, uh, Chinese myth mythology, or like some people share the different like anime from different countries, and all the inspiration they just instantly visualize with mid-journey. For example, like this, uh, this mechanic, how about this mechanical design that inspired by something and something and something. So uh, visualization of the taste is really powerful. Um, yeah, my favorite uh, AI artist says, taste is new skill, and that is the core. Thank you, that's interesting. Nora, uh, Figma is obviously a collaboration platform for everybody, right? Uh, especially non-designers and non-coders and the business type of people can join in the creative process. And uh, do you notice that the, the fundamental change uh, by using uh, AI to, uh, to refine or uh, change the, that kind of uh, creative collaboration process on Figma? Yeah, I think it's something we're very interested in exploring right now, you know, only about 30% of our current customers are designers, or at least label themselves as designers. So actually, the majority of people coming into Figma every day are developers, product managers, marketers, all kinds of people that are coming in to collaborate. Um, and, and we hope that, you know, right now, we've shortened the gap a little bit to collaborate. Whereas before you had to hope that a designer would send you a link and you could get to see their work into a shared space that people are creating together and are having conversations. But today, if you think about even without AI, most of that interaction looks like cursors moving around, maybe leaving a comment, asking questions, uh, hopefully getting to the root of what you're trying to make and moving it forward. But pretty much only designers are still the ones creating. Uh, and I wonder if there is a world where we can kind of one of the ways we've been describing this is like lower the floor. So make it easier for more people to enter the room of design and collaborate. We're all kind of visual people. You know, we all have a shared understanding of what we're trying to make. But um, for a long time, you know, just like if you think of digital photography, uh, before digital photography, you only had a certain subset of people in the world that had access to take a photo or could could make a living from it. Uh, and over time, eventually, more and more people around the world were able to contribute. And even if they're not a professional photographer, they can still kind of, you know, contribute or, or take uh, capture something in the world. And I wonder if that shift could happen with design, too, where more people might feel empowered to do it if they had easier tools. Right now, you have to have learned, you know, a lot of pretty complex things, know what auto layout or prototyping is, and it might be kind of complex. I don't know what the total space of the people in the world who, you know, are interested in, in creating, you know, content, but I think a lot of people probably are and wish they could communicate visually, whether that's, you know, an application or otherwise. Um, so I think, you know, to your question, I don't know that we've noticed a major shift yet outside of a desire from people to participate and leave comments or, you know, just in seeing that we have so many people coming in to, to do that. Um, but I do wonder if even just, you know, you take a big file and you enter, I don't know how many of you have entered a Figma file and there's a lot of content. You can imagine AI can also summarize the content that's there a lot easier or know the right place to look and to jump in. And so any amount of lowering of friction uh, seems valuable to get people to talk about what they're trying to build. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, on uh, Figma platform, we, we now can talk with AI, but talk with people at the same time. So conversation is not occupied by humans, but the actually AI can communicate with us to enhance our creative process. <laughs> That's a really interesting scenery. Okay, Shiho-san. Yeah. All right, thank you for waiting. Um, Shiho-san is also multidisciplinary artist, scientist, developer, and uh, researchers, whatever. And uh, uh, please um, give us a quick introduction of what uh, you are doing. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Shiho Fukuhara. I'm sorry if I'm too bright. I'm like a mirable. I feel like I'm became mirable with good light. <laughs> um, do you, 
is this the camera that John and Noah are looking at? No. <laughs> 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 yeah, so um, I'm an artist, researcher, and also an um, innovator. I work, I've been working with uh, soft, wet, bio, uh, and also the natural science materials. What that means, like I work with DNA, I work with wearable technologies, I work with textiles, I work with uh, craftsmen and ceramics, uh, basically everything like around what we can find in the, on the earth, for me it's a material that I can create and use as a tool. But I actually, when I received the in, uh, invitation from Grovis, um, I read it and I was really like, why? Me, <laughs> first thought. <laughs> but hey, John, I, I met you when I was at the Google ATAP, and I remember you, you gave me a one word uh, when we met at like, having artists at companies, very good thing. And uh, so I remember that, and I thought this is like, you know, maybe the reason why I'm here as like another perspective. And I'm not so used to AI, I'm, learn I'm still learning. Probably I'm like uh, beginners. And uh, I try to understand what this really means, artificial intelligence. And uh, yeah, last few years uh, being interested in artificial life. So obviously I thought there's some link, but there's a clear differentiation between just intelligence and life because just in with the intelligence, you cannot create life. So how the artificial intelligence can, can create something like, need, like something we can um, but not only benefit, but inspire. So that's why, like uh, Amy is a very good example, I think, that she, she has been using the tools and also like expanding her possibility of expressions which is great, and also Figma, I use FigJam, I use Figma. Um, it's great as like through online, it's been very difficult for me to work with US team, but with Fig, uh, Figma, I could see people's making uh, thinking, like taking time to think, uh, making corrections, making mistakes, and I can see all that process and that was the most, uh, when I started using Figma, was the very inspiring tools. And I think it, having AI with Figma and uh, also Microsoft tools, uh, I hope that there's some like, uh, this is gonna be like uh, one of the inspirational tools for us to feel free to um, make mistakes. So, because we are always worried about making mistakes, but then, and we, many, some, some people say, like, yeah, AI makes mistakes, a lot of mis mistakes, and they lie, etc. But I think that's the best thing, because um, the creative things is coming from out of um, unexpected things, and all serendipity is coming from un unthought, like uh, something that you haven't thought before. So I wanted to actually propose what is opposite of AI is hentai AI. <laughs> hentai, uh, <laughs> I have to explain to Noah and some of the people who doesn't know hentai means. So hentai means different, has many meanings actually. So in what I'm sure you, when I mention hentai, the first thing is pervert, like <laughs> otaku or something like, that's like kind of negative word that you thought of, but I'm, I do biology uh, research, so hentai is actually a good thing in biology. It's a transformer. So it transforms something out of expectations. So there's kind of the orders and there's an order and chaos and um, something you cannot still yet see or understand. And that's what hentai does to give to us. So I thought like hentai intelligence can be maybe like the next 
uh, fun things to, to, yeah. to do? Yeah, quite similar things uh, has been spoken by John, actually. The, the in, um, I remember uh, you did a, you wrote a, the blog uh, post on uh, Figma uh, shortcut uh, blog about uh, how human uh, should have, you know, what kind of uh, work or what kind of role we, is going to be hired by human and by AI. And then AI tend to be quite risk averse uh, in a decision maker. So uh, humans will take kind of longer term um, uh, work. It's kind of non-efficient uh, uh, thinking, per se, to find out uh, very unique think or thought uh, in very weird and eccentric process in, in, in our brains. But uh, John, I've got one question. Uh, you uh, looked at for years and years about computational design, and uh, we actually experienced so many invention and innovation within that uh, computer science and computer engineering in industry for many years. And uh, now we have generative AI uh, since last year. And then do you uh, define this generative AI is going to be a kind of change maker or it is fundamentally different from uh, conventional computer science or technology or generative AI is different? Um, wh what do you think? And uh, the second question is uh, the Shiho's things. Uh, in generative AI era, how designers should um, use ourselves uh, to contribute to creating something new or creating tools or uh, products? I don't know. I think uh, I think uh, when I was talking with Noah the other day, he, I think he was saying like, so like you're kind of feel seem kind of down about stuff. And I'm, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, like, you know, yourself, you know, Kenya, you're like a design engineer. You talk about design and engineering, the two together, right? And computational design has always been the combination of design and engineering. And I think this new kind of AI, um, on the one hand, you could think that it's for non-coders, but it actually changes the game for coders. And so, and I think of systems like Figma, FigJam as, as highly computational design oriented products. So um, I think that the tools are able to illustrate certain behaviors faster. Uh, like uh, when, when Noah was describing Figma, I remembered, you know, uh, uh, thank you for bringing up the, uh, the the failure theme. I've invested in so many small companies that have failed. <laughs> I invested in Envision. Um, Envision was a good idea when it first started, but it wasn't for designers. It was for product managers and marketers. And, and, and I like how FigJam later discovered that, like uh, you're mentioning, Noah, that a lot of the people who are using it are not designers. It's because in reality, uh, the work that designers do and artists do, unfortunately, is governed by the people who cannot make anything. I call them the talkers. You have the makers and you have the talkers. And the problem now is that generative art, generative design results in so much making to occur that the talkers can control the entire thing just with talking. Uh, so I think we've entered a whole new era where on the one hand, generative art AI looks so creative and powerful, but it may be an era where the talkers have much more power than ever imagined before. So uh, I personally am curious about how more design engineering can occur to move the bar so much further ahead um, that's where my energy is being spent right now. How do you get there? I don't know. That's why I'm just writing as much combination of native code and semantic code together to see like, huh, what is that? Interesting, thank you. Nora, do you have some words uh, uh, about John's uh, talk? Yeah, I know. I, I love that that thought that like, you know, I, I'm sure some of you have heard like the the parables of, you know, when you split a team into two parts, there's there's a story of um, I forget who wrote it, it was an art and fear, a good book um, where, where one team was told to like build the, the perfect pot. They were in a ceramics class and the other team was told to make as many pots as possible. 
And it's a great story about, you know, the team that ends up uh, making the better pot was the one that made a bunch, not the talker team, but the maker team. And so, you know, I wonder what if, if what the version of that is today, like if, if there's less and less friction to making, to John's point, you need friction somewhere to actually make good decisions. Like you can't just throw something out there and expect it to work. You can't, you know, you know, if you handed even just a simple design, like a menu design at a restaurant, but it was jarbled together and there was no basic foundation of, you know, what was legible design or anything like that, like that wouldn't be the better pot in this story just because they could create it and put it into the world. So to, to John's kind of question about where this is headed and, and merging this with technology and computational design, you know, design systems were intended to create some guardrails for people um, so that they could make, you know, clearer, easier to use things and trying to build on the foundations many of us learned in design school to, uh, to make it easier for you to just in interface with technology and not have that friction. Uh, and so I don't know if that's part of it where like these, you know, these systems just make it easier to generate using certain rules and that makes it better, but you still have to think, like John said, you still have to make a decision. You still have to decide who is this for? What are we doing? And so my hope is that, okay, sure, you know, making gets faster potentially, or you can generate ideas on off the top of your head in a, in a quicker way, but you're still doing the same level of strategic decision making. You're still doing, you know, even if you're using a design system or not in that example, you have to decide, like, and your customers will decide for you when they use it, like, did this work? And so if the iterative loops are faster because you can make faster, that feels okay to me. Um, if, if you're getting to a place where the, the design ends up being better, people have an easier time. Um, but I'm not sure. There's also the, it's possible that we'll just get a lot more, you know, just all kinds of products. Same for like the industrial revolution when all kinds of just things could be made and you could get them faster. It doesn't mean they're better. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, this is going to be like industry revolution, right? And uh, I've got another question to Nora. Um, when we look into the um, more tangible uh, interface of uh, soft, uh, smartphone or PC, uh, the um, chat box is going to be the very powerful interface in between human and the user and computer. And, uh, and that is quite similar um, occasion when we look at the first generation of iPhone that introduced uh, the touch panel user in interface uh, into the industry. And then uh, emergence of that kind of touch panel uh, interaction, actually the older uh, design uh, rule or design uh, manner has been, uh, had been rewritten, right? So um, do you have any kind of vision for the near future? Uh, our um, HCI uh, interaction model is going to be um, changed uh, because we have kind of narrative communication Model modality in between uh, the user and the computer. Yeah, good question. You know, there. So if you first think about what is it about these chat interfaces, like why are they coming back? What, what's happening there? And you know, and obviously anyone who's into sci-fi or into any kind of fiction sees a world of interacting with technology where it's even just by voice. And you know, there's you know, whether it's Star Trek or the movie Her or other things. Um, and the reason that people often come back to these interfaces once technology catches up with it is because natural language is one of the more intuitive things we have, but also because AI is often wrong on the first go and you need to refine it. And when you're refining something, you're either using a precise tool, or in this case, you're just giving feedback like we would when we refine any process together. And so it makes sense that a lot of people went straight to, to chat interfaces as a place to deal with a technology that's also still trying to figure itself out, still potentially working, but is also efficient. You don't want to have 100 apps on your phone. You know, I think we all, if you work in technology, we often think our app is the most important thing or people want this. But the average person probably just wants to get on with their day, probably just wants to have you know, some, maybe there, if there's some entertainment use case, sure. But otherwise, like, I don't know that they need all of these things. And so having a simple box, just like we used to with Google, um, but when the answers are faster and better, kind of makes sense. But does that mean that's the future of all interaction with technologies? Is it just voice? Is it just chatting in a box back and forth? I don't know. I, I would doubt it. I feel like there's something really like um, enriching about really interfacing with the tool in a more meaningful way. And I think you're going to have a mixed modalities in the future. And so you might have some combination of chat or voice or giving feedback to a system, but you're also going to want to tune it and adjust it in ways that are, you know, I saw someone had a, you know, they're refining with text. It took them like 10 or 20, you know, paragraphs to get to the design they wanted in some of these tools that are happening today. 
And if you're just using another design tool, you might just change the size or relabel it and it'll just be done. And so there are obviously places where chat just isn't as efficient as directly manipulating content. Um, but I don't, I'm not great at predicting the future. You know, I think maybe, you know, six months from now, these, this world could look different three years from now. I'm not sure. Uh, but I do think there's value and I get why people use a lot of these chat interfaces is because you need to refine it. It's not often right. And it's natural. It's the way that we talk to everyone every day. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, last week I actually had a look at the uh, financial times news and then that says, uh, SoftBank uh, will, uh, invest a certain amount of money to set up new company with OpenAI to create a AI-based uh, new smartphone with um, designed by the former uh, Apple CDO Johnny Ive. That's coming. Okay. So, Amy San, um, do you have any kind of uh, future vision how how to use AI or uh, I don't know new technology to enhance your creative work? Thank you for asking. Um, I don't know. I I can't even uh, expect for a couple months from now. But I would like to um, work uh, with AI to create uh, um, movies and also um, right now, uh, Shinsei Galvers is n now uh, focusing on handcrafting anime with community together. But when, whenever I re release the first version of the anime, maybe uh, next version will be um, AI um, collaborated series uh, where anyone can generate a new episode of Galvers. Um, it's just the idea. It's not the... Um, releasing <laughs> uh, information <laughs> but um I, I i i believe um in a couple of years uh when you open the netflix or whatever streaming services you can watch like back to the future four five six seven once episode 1000 or like K like Korean soap opera version or like G Studio Ghibli style really? or like anything <laughs> like you can create just like that like you have to think about utopian scenario and dystopian scenario uh, at the same time and I'm thinking about like all the stuff interesting Shiho san yeah so the use of AI in future I hope it's going to be like not only screen based so, because we are living surrounded by materials, so if every material can be smart, and every material can be having AI, and then tools, so that's gonna be the real like ambient computations. And so, yeah, we are compute. Um, what happens if our world is gonna be smart and more and more, and then computation is like something you don't even think. So then you don't even call it technology anymore because inter as the internet became normal things to have, AI becoming a normal things to have, maybe we don't no longer call it AI, then what would happen? And then beyond screen. So I'm very looking forward and yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, our kind of tangible world is probably 10 times bigger than digital space. So that actually Shiho-san uh, did a very, very fantastic creation with Google uh, to create a Jagad project. This is smart uh, textile project for many years, but uh, okay, uh, we've got the paper. So uh, this is a Q and Q and A uh, time. So, uh, all right, so let me open uh, the floor. So uh, please give us a, uh, your quick comment or question to the, this fantastic panelist. So if you've got um, anything, uh, please raise your hand and please identify yourself first and make your uh, question concise in 30 seconds, please. Yeah, thank you so much everyone for uh, sharing. It's, this is so insightful and so uh, just, I don't know, exciting to hear from all of you guys. Uh, my question is, I'm, so I'm a full-time MBA student here at Globus. Uh, I'm from California. Uh, I worked in copywriting advertising for the past seven, eight years. Um, so as obviously working with words, you know, storytelling was such a big uh, buzzword, I feel, within companies. Storytelling. How do you, for you guys, uh, whether it's uh, work for brands or your personal work, how has um, your interaction with the written word, with content, changed? And how do you see that changing uh, 
you know, for the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next, next one. All right, please. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Oh, thank you um, for your valuable insight. I'm also a student at Globus University. Uh, I think everyone has shared um, um, the benefits of using AI as artists. But I also want to raise concern about, you know, as artists, there are like, um, there are potential issues with the copyright. And there are people also saying, oh, this is AI generated, this is like, you know, this is an artist work, this is like programming work. So as artists, um, um, Emi-san or shiho san how would you like, what would you tell the art, like future artists to say, oh, how would you define yourself artist and cope with those intellectual property issues? Thank you. All right, any others? Oh. Can't remember the <laughs> questions. Can't remember. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. So the first question is for the uh, utilization of AI for co um, narratives, uh, spoken words. Um, all right. Somebody, do you have any comment on the first question, John? Nora. Um, well, I've I've really been enjoying everything from Emmy and Shiho, so I, I really want to hear what they have. The answer is on the art side. So um, the only thing I would add is uh, uh, I got my MBA as a hobby a long time ago. So that MBA student over there, uh, I think you're asking a question of uh, what is scarce is actually what is valuable. And when high quality things are no longer scarce, it does diminish the value significantly. Um, so we're going to have to ask many questions about the value of words because it's a large language model, language words. Um, it's going to change that whole space in a way that we can't predict. Yeah, thank you. Noah, do you have any kind of uh, creative uh, tool to support that kind of narrative uh, creative process on Figma? Um, I guess narratives can be told in a lot of ways. So you can tell narratives through through images, through words, through video, through all kinds of different, you know, uh, mediums. Even a conversation is a narrative in a meeting. And so, you know, as far as our tools are concerned, you know, it might be anything from the stories you tell. Like sometimes people are using Figma for slide decks and they're creating things that way. Um, you know, in FigGem, of course, you can use it to brainstorm uh, all kinds of, you know, narrative directions and you know, there, I think it's it's less interesting to me what is AI doing to, you know, to generate lots of stories, because as John said, you know, you really want to find the valuable ones or the ones that really stand out. And that, I think, does require a lot of curation and a lot of taste and things where people in a room are looking at those options and comparing them to make sense of them and say, does this actually land? Do we get this? And that part of the process, the feedback giving, the refinement, I feel like a story is rarely great its first time around. You're probably going to have to, you know, change it a few times before it really lands with you and with someone else. And so that editing process, whether it's with AI or not, is still going to be something that people invest in. But um, but yeah, definitely curious about Shiho and Emmy's view and if this is different in the art world or things like that. Mm, thank you. Um, we've got very interesting news from uh, Hollywood. Um, and then they had a huge strike uh, on uh, uh, by the uh, story um, uh, scenario writers. And then uh, in between companies and scenario writers, uh, they had a kind of agreement. And then that sentences are so interesting. Actually, the right to use the AI is on the side of writers, not on the side of uh, companies. And this is the final uh, agreement in between two parties. So, um, okay, so the second question, that is very deep, uh, insightful question. So do you have some words for, um, uh, for his question. So what do you define uh, yourself as an artist? You know, um, because uh, the, all the creation are uh, learned by you know, the uh, knowledge and uh, text on, on the web, and then that supports you to create something new. So how, so probably the essence of art is um, how generated uh, within that kind of collaboration artist plus um, AI. So, yeah, that's a really difficult question. That's a really <laughs> hard question. Um, for now, I, I'm very privileged to um, uh, showcase my AI art as like because it's Genesis. 
Um, but um, I think in the future, uh, people cannot recognize whether if it's made by AI or made by human, and it's gonna be really hard, but um, mm, this question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, thank you for good questions. Yeah, so it's been like same question since the, you know, the computation started, also the age of printing and photographies. The price of the art uh, works as a photography is now going to be like, I just heard about, I'm not sure like if it's really 100% uh, true story, but like third of the price since the like 10 years, w because we are now taking a lot of photography with uh, you know, mobile phones, and the, you know, the idea of the authenticity changed. So I think that's why the IP and copyright should also change in a way to fit to the current um, temperatures of issues, but when I think about copyright IPs, about one person versus a third person, me to you others, right? me is first person and the third person is others, but then the AI is not, not even one person or third person, it's 2.5 person. So in my need, you might need to also have right for AI as 2.5 persons as like right to create, right to say this is done by AI. So that's, uh, yeah, um, I'm optimist in a way. And uh, Amy, yeah. I think you are hyper optimist. I, ha that. I <laughs> have to be, I have to be op <laughs> optimistic to this AI thing. Um, I think when, when the AI uh, has a uh, right to buy something, uh, like right to have a bank account, it will change like everything. Like you, like some people are gonna be marketing to AI to like logical way. So the narrative, uh, like definition of narrative, is also changing. And when aesthetic was democratized by AI, like all this, mm, all these things are like changing. And we we don't have a, we still uh, have a like def definition of death right now because uh, uh, we we don't have a digital human everyone everyone when everyone has a digital human there's no death basically so <laughs> it's gonna be changing like everything and it's hard to imagine the future uh, but I would like to be yeah, optimistic. It's a kind <laughs> of uh, uh, meta question for you so maybe we should rewrite about copyright definition yeah, yeah. Definitely. all right that's good okay we've got uh five minutes for the last so we are going to have a, a kind of a comment or uh, yeah. advice or whatever vision uh one by one john uh, please give, give us a kind of final comment or words for for our audience oh well i i, I think that um you should not listen to older people and listen to younger people because older people are very stupid right now about this so i say listen to emmy and shiho more than it's someone like myself <laughs> thank you all right <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay noah please <laughs> well i don't know uh you know everyone in the room and, and what you all do you know for a living but i certainly hope you're just exploring and trying things uh you know there's there's new ai tools almost every day at this point uh and some of them are probably going to be not very useful or interesting, but some of them probably are and might change the way that you're doing things. And so we have like an internal Slack channel at Figma where we're every day just sending inspiration, ideas, ways we're trying it to explore new things. Um, so, you know, whether it's related to work or not, just uh, keep an open mind and try things out to develop your own perspective of what you think uh, is useful and what you think is just sort of hype. Thank you. All right, Amy Sound. Um, whether if you're optimistic or not, this thing is already there and it's changing our life forever in the next 
exponentially. So uh, please uh, try ChatGPT or Midjourney and utilizing for your work and see how you get the friends with AI. Thank you, Shio-san. Yeah, so um, John, as John said, like uh, scared of variables, um, I listen to you still even say don't listen. <laughs> Um, my, I think just came to my mind that be water, my friend. Don't be scared, just use it, as Amy said. And I think AI, it could be something like water too, as like a natural flow. And don't, don't think, feed it, use it, make it, and be stronger. <laughs> That's uh, my call, yeah, close. Thank you, thank you everyone. We, we have a great conversation about uh, the intersection around design plus uh, AI. And uh, as you hear, uh, we have so many opportunities around uh, this area. And AI plus probably creativity uh, enforced by AI. Maybe um, creativity will change uh, the exist existence of AI, as, as you said. Maybe copyright um, concept will be rewritten by us too. So, um, all right, so we're going to have a probably very exciting uh, five years or 10 years and to look at the new age of uh, innovation. All right, uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to this panel and thank you. And uh, please uh, give a big hand to them. Thank you, thank you very much.